Uh, I want to begin just by saying on behalf of all of us, thank you to uh, Barbara and to Mosen, not just for sponsoring this conference, but for keeping faith with the subject of Iran. Uh, for many years, through ups and downs, uh, I think it's, it's really important and we're all uh, pleased to, to be here. Our fourth panelist, Vali Nasser, uh, we hope will be here with us um, uh, soon. In this uh, first panel, we want to talk about uh, the legacy of the revolution, the event that happened 40 years ago. But we also want to talk about its future trajectory. To paraphrase uh, Dave Petraeus and the r remark he famously made on the way uh, to Baghdad uh, and Mosul to my colleague Rick Atkinson, tell me how this ends during the invasion of Iraq. Tell me how this ends. And uh, maybe we'll have a little conversation today about this revolution now 40 years old. Um, tell me how, how, it, how it ends. I want to begin with, with Ambassador Limbert, uh, who, uh, as, as uh, Barbara and Mosin said, uh, was present uh, as this revolution began. He was a Foreign Service officer who had arrived, John, what, three months before uh, in, in Tehran, uh, and uh, ha not three months before the revolution, but three months before he was taken uh, prisoner when the embassy was seized. Uh, he has a, a unique perspective, and, and Ambassador, I'm going to ask you to, to start with the basic question. How can it be that 40 years later, these two significant countries, the United States and Iran, still don't have diplomatic relations. How is that possible? What happened? That, that's a terrific question. Actually, it's worse than that. I mean, it's not only that we don't have diplomatic relations, but we have great difficulty uh, speaking to each other in a productive way. Um, I, I ask myself that question a lot. As a matter of fact, um, it is when I was after I left the Foreign Service, I taught for, for 12 years at the Naval Academy. I taught history and political science. And that very question was my final exam question to the midshipmen. Why are relations so, why are relations so bad? And why have they been so bad for so long, uh, so long? And then they would ask me the question. They would say, well, what's the answer? And I said, I haven't a clue. I really don't know. But when Professor Milani spoke, speaks about experts. You know, actually being, being an expert here um, about Iran isn't that hard. You only, you have to be able to say two things. Either I don't know, or it's very complicated. <laughs> and that covers about 95%. Uh, uh, 95%. Oh, you also have to be ready to be wrong a lot. Uh, a lot of people were wrong about the revolution. I mean, Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Car uh, uh, Barbara mentioned Jimmy, Car uh, Jimmy Carter. And if you had looked at Iran in 1977, uh, at least from the, you know, from the outside, things looked pretty good. Uh, so I've been wrong a lot. I thought that after uh, after the um, hostage, after we were released, um, over five years, ten years maybe, uh, we and the Iranians, if we didn't become friends, at least we would find ways of talking to each other. Uh, we would move beyond this model of um, standing on both sides, on, on opposite sides of an abyss, glaring at each other, um, trading insults, trading threats, trading accusations, calling each, other uh, 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 calling each other names. Well, I was wrong there. We've been stuck in that for 40 years. And I should say on a personal note, I, I, you know, I speak about this with some hesitation. I haven't been to Iran, unlike my colleagues, um, of whom I'm very jealous, by the way. I have not been to Iran now. I think it's been 38, year, uh, uh, 38 years. Uh, and that's not by my choice. Uh, I would love to go, but I'm just not, wel uh, not welcome. Uh, but we have been we have been we have been stuck, and the, the question of the question of why part of it um, 
is, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of blame to go around on both sides. There are missteps on both sides, Misinterpret misinterpretation, suspic uh, sus suspicions, bad timing, bad mixture personalities, whatever it was. For example, when uh, President Obama came, came to office in 2009, from the very beginning, from even in time of his campaign, he said, I want to change this. Uh, we need to be talking to the Islamic Republic. And he used, in his very first Nowruz message, he said, um, I have a message for the people and the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran, dripping with symbolism, the, those very words. And he, wa he did want to change things. Uh, but it took four years before the things started to move, to, um, to move. And as bad fortune or whatever would have it, uh, by the time they did negotiate an agreement, by the time the ice started to thaw, it was, the time ran out. And we were, fa we were faced with new realities, particularly in, Wash uh, 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 particul particularly in Washington. But what, what I found, and I did a brief stint back, uh, uh, back at the uh, State Department in the beginning of the Obama administration, and this was 2009, 2010. And frankly, what I found, David, to get back to your question, why, why has this been so difficult? People on both sides didn't know how to do anything else. For, thir for 35 years, 36 years, uh, they had learned to bash the other side. They had learned to annoy the other, si uh, uh, the other side. And that they did very well. When it came time to do something else, to look at exploring common areas, to exploring how do we work, how might we work together in Afghanistan? How might we work together against some of the extremist groups in the area? How might we work together against drug, traffic, uh, drug trafficking? Frankly, people just didn't know how to do it. Nobody had done it. It was unexplored. It was uh, it was unexplored territory, and as soon as anyone tried, if they the first at the first setback, and there are always going to be setbacks in any diplomatic uh, movement or dynamic like this. At the first setback, they said, "You see, you can't do it," and they immediately fell back into a default position, which was. How do we make life as unpleasant and as difficult as possible for the other side? So, John, I'm going to ask uh, what we journalists like to call a follow-up question, uh, <laughs> just, just briefly. And that is, let's assume for the moment that President Trump had not been elected, that the priority had not been to um, uh, tear up, uh, walk away from the JCPOA, but that you'd had some extension of the basic idea that Obama had, which I will summarize as uh, in a, a situation of gradual opening and modernization of Iran, uh, that engagement will produce over time a different Iran politically. Do you think that would have happened? Uh, it, well, it, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you an interesting story here. This is a, this is a good question. Bef before the election, a lot of my Iranian friends were very worried about what would happen if Secretary Clinton had been elected. Because they looked at her statements and her record, and she was, I mean, it was no secret, she was less than enthusiastic. Um, about the opening to uh, uh, Iran, and that's what they were worried about. Now, of course, they say, "Oh, that was that was nothing." Um, where would it have gone? It's a good question. I, I assume that's where, that is, what you're that really asking. Yes. Uh, uh, would it have changed? You know, would it have changed the, the would have changed the Islamic Republic, which is already changed. Which already, I would suggest, the Islamic Republic is already changing without much help from the outside, without much help from the outside. Um, but 
the, the, I think the, assu the assumption was that if we can find a new way of dealing with an adversary, if we can find a new way of dealing with a country which we, with which we have difficulties and which we will have difficulties, and if we can show that that way is more productive than the old way of just yelling at each other, uh, then where then there are it, oh, what it does is open up new possibilities. It opens up possibilities that have not existed for for, for forty years. I th my sense from be from it from within the administration was that there really was no illusion that the Islamic Republic you know was going to change into a place that treated its people better that treated its women uh, more decently, that didn't arrest people for random, re uh, uh, random reasons. That, those basics were, were not going to change, or if they were going to change, they were going to change slowly. Uh, but this was a, po I think the policy was, this was a policy that was seen in American interests as natu uh, 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 naturally, but if it led to and leading to a kind of communication that we hadn't had uh, really since 1979. So, P Professor uh, Milani, you've been one of the leading historians of this revolution, this, this story uh, uh, that began 40 years ago and, and, and continues. In any narrative history, uh, as in a work of fiction, we think of the arc of the story, and I'd be very interested in how you describe the arc of this revolution uh, over time. And to ask you one more question uh, to set up your opening remarks. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says often when he's talking about Iran that he wants Iran to be a normal country. That's his, his buzzword, just being a, a normal country. Um, and I sometimes wonder uh, whether that's possible. Uh, given the way the revolution is structured, given the nature of, of, of power in Iran. So tell us both about the arc of the story as you see it, and then whether normal uh, is, uh, is, is realistic. Uh, David, I remember when I invited you to come to USF for a conversation. I ask you easy questions. <laughs> and now you're putting me in a very <laughs> difficult position. And I also want to tell, uh, John here, that uh, you were wrong. You can go to Iran right now if you want to. One way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Having said this, though, going to your question, um, I remember 40 years ago when the revolution happened. I was in California enjoying uh, uh, surfing in Huntington Beach and uh, was very happy uh, that we are having a revolution in Iran. I cannot speak, as has become customary for most Iranians, on behalf of 80 million people. I can only speak on my own behalf. I was in favor of that revolution because I thought we're going to have democracy in Iran. We're going to have a more open, transparent system in Iran. And I thought that the Shah was wasting our precious resources on things that Iran didn't need. Well, and at that time, I hadn't studied other revolutions. And the idea of revolution was new and exciting to me and to my generation. Uh, right now, people think Iran is on the verge of another revolution. As someone who has studied and taught about the great revolutions in, in France and Russia and China and Iran, I simply do not see the conditions of a, another revolution. And let me be very clear. When I talk about the revolution, I'm talking about fundamental change uh, that is brought about by participation of the masses. Revolution is different than coup d'etats. Revolutions are different than massive transformations. If you go back to 1979, first of all, you see there was a clear identifiable leadership, both inside Iran and outside of Iran, that they were connected. 
Khomeini had established himself as a leader, as one of the leaders of revolution as early as 1963 when he challenged the Shah and his relationship with the US. Inside Iran, there was a national front that, had, that was the, uh, that the inheritor of the legacy of the great Muhammad Mossadegh. So there was organization inside Iran and leadership. And they had a vision. Now, you might disagree with the vision they had, but they thought that they can change things for the better. And since the Iranians haven't experienced anything massive, they fell into it because there was a hope for a better future. Revolutions don't happen unless you see a better future for yourself. Today in Iran, we don't have, uh, we lack leadership. There are people who claim to have leadership, but they really don't have great social bases inside Iran. And my recommendation to policy experts in Washington is that whoever tells you they have, uh, they are in contact with revolutionary guards or they have a popular base of support, ask him for identifiable <laughs> Uh, sources that you can actually prove that they, I don't think they do. They have, some of them have uh, good names. Uh, they have uh, good names of their father, but that doesn't mean they can lead a revolution. Uh, and therefore, we don't have that kind of leadership. There is no evidence that there is uh, a social base inside Iran that would like to see change on a radical uh, scale. Imagine you are a middle class Iranian, more or less educated. 90% of Iranians can read and write. Iran of today is very different than Iran of 1979. When the revolution happened in Iran, there was no great instability in the region. Today, an Iranian middle class or Iranian even working class uh, looks at the future, it doesn't look that bright. They look at Afghanistan. Please tell me, what is so inspirational about Afghanistan? They see Iraq, and we have an expert looking at me here on Iraq and Syria. What is so inspirational about what has happened in Iraq and, and Syria, or in Lebanon, or in Yemen, or in Libya? Why would they want to take a big risk? What we often confuse in Washington is discontent with willingness to launch a revolution. These are two different things. So today, I simply do not see Iran being on the verge of a revolution, although I do see Iran being on the verge of more drastic change. And let me end by uh, responding to the question you asked. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> from John, because I have been on, on the stages with John many times, and one thing I have learned is do not ever challenge him, always compliment him, and then say things that are in support of what he said. <laughs> I think if Washington, if Washington would have been wise enough to continue with the policies of the Obama administration, Iran and America would be in a much better position. Let me just give you two examples. As a result of the withdrawal from the uh, nuclear deal, uh, the moderate forces in Iran, whatever you want to call them. I know in Washington they say there is no moderates in Iran. Everybody is crazy. But inside Iran, we do have moderates versus radicals. It would have strengthened them. But even more importantly, I think what was behind Obama's policy was a 10-year period in which Iran gradually would rejoin the international community. This 10 year, I think, next 10 year, is going to be profoundly important for Iran in two ways. A new generation is gonna come to power in Iran. Whether they're pro-American or anti-American depends on what America does. So a new generation is coming to power in Iran. 60% of Iranians don't have any recollection of the revolution in Iran. Equally important is that in the next 10 years, we're going to see the succession to Ayatollah Khamenei. And right now, the likelihood of another hardliner replacing him have increased exponentially as a result of this uh, animosity between the US and uh, Iran. 
So we'll come back uh, later to the question of what uh, post uh, Khamenei Iran uh, might look like. But I, I want to turn now to Nazila Fateh. Fateh. New York Times readers uh, know her byline, her vivid uh, reportage. Uh, she's also written a wonderful book uh, about Iran. But um, when we think about this 40-year story, uh, Nazila was a girl of nine when the revolution happened on the streets in Tehran. That's 40 years ago. 10 years ago, when what we call the Green Revolution was happening, she was in the streets courageously covering that story uh, for the New York Times with the reporting that, that I, can, I can still remember. And I want to ask you to um, take up the challenge that the first two speakers have, have set, really, which is this question of where this story is going. And of this a majority of Iranians who were born after the revolution, you, you've seen them, you've reported on them. Give us a, a sense of that dimension of Iran that we, that we don't see and where that's going. Um, well, thank you, David. And thank you, Mr. Milani and John. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, I, you know, when I look at Iran uh, and what happened 10 years ago, and when, where Iran is right now, I see a very different country. Um, and this is mostly uh, based on what I read, based on the videos that I watch, and from what I hear from people, and clearly from my own family who is still in Iran. Iran has become a very different country today. Um, it was a different country 10 years ago than it was when I was nine years old. And I have to say, when I was growing up, at least uh, during the first decade after the revolution, I was convinced that the regime would change. Uh, but when I started working as a reporter in my early 20s, I, I was convinced that this regime is not going to fall, and it's going to last for a very long um, time. And I think at this stage, if we want to put a human age to it, um, the Islamic Revolution is definitely towards the end of its teen years, uh, <laughs> when it was rebellious and it wanted to, uh, you know, show an identity on the world stage. Those days are gone, and uh, you hear this from a lot of Iranian officials, from a lot of Iranian leaders. When Hassan Rouhani came to power, uh, right after his election, he said, if you want to speak to Iran, speak in the language of respect. Do not speak in the language of sanctions. And uh, these are, I think, very clear signs that Iranian leaders uh, want to be recognized. Uh, they want to adopt a more uh, responsible role as a regional player in the Middle East. And they are expecting to be treated with more respect. And that's what the Obama administration gave them. Yeah. Uh, but every other uh, president, whether they were a a a Democrats or Republicans, they have pursued the policy of isolating Iran, and isolating a country, and forces that actually thrive in isolation. So they, give them, they gave them the best gift that they needed. Uh, on the other hand, the Iranian people, they found their own way of communicating with the regime. And it has been the Iranian people that has changed uh, the way the Iranian regime uh, acts. Um, I mean, let's start with the first demonstrations, anti-regime protests that started in 1999. Uh, if we look at every single one of those demonstrations, they were cracked down. Uh, the leaders of those protests were uh, jailed. Uh, and we can call every single one of them as a failure. Uh, but you know, there were other protests that followed up. Uh, people learned from their previous mistakes. They started using the internet and satellite TV to organize. And we mistakenly thought, OK, this is a movement. This is a movement with a leadership. We didn't realize that this was an illusion. They were using the internet and satellite TV to organize to communicate with the regime. And so all those protests that were uh, taking place every year since 99 and finally led to uh, the massive uprising of 2009, I think they were all ways for Iranian people to communicate uh, with Iranian leadership. 
to send their messages. And in 2009, they came out and said, enough is enough. You know, you're asking us to come to the, uh, to the polling stations to take part in the elections. And once we do, you do not recognize our vote. They were not angry that Musavi was not elected. They were angry that they had been cheated and their votes had been stolen. And I think, uh, despite the crackdown, um, and you know, just to go back to the fact how Iranians see uh, the crackdown and uh, a bloody reaction by the regime, about 100 people uh, were killed, uh, and Iranians called it a bloody crackdown. I compare that to uh, the Arab Spring and how many people were killed in the Arab Spring, and the Arabs always refer to it as a peaceful revolution. So for Iranians, the 2009 uprising and the crackdown was a bloody one because 100 people and thousands of others uh, were jailed and tortured. But it did send a very clear message to Iranian leadership. And I think that was what led to the change in the behavior of the regime inside the country over the past 10 years. Uh, Hassan al-Rouhani is to blame for many things. I mean, the economy is in shambles. The sanctions are responsible. But he is also. Um, responsible for economic mismanagement. But Iran has opened up. Uh, socially, it's a very different country than it was 10 years ago. Uh, you go to Iran, people who go to Iran, they know that women are not really wearing the headscarf anymore. That was one of the symbols of the Islamic regime, and it's almost gone now. Uh, every, in every square, you see uh, musical bands. Music was banned after the revolution. I don't remember a single music ban on the streets of Tehran 10 years ago when I was there. Yeah. Uh, things have changed, and a lot of these changes were things that people wanted. People who were protesting on the streets as early as 1999 were asking for these very, very simple things. And I don't want to diminish uh, people's political and economic demands. They are very legitimate. But if you're living in Iran, especially if you're a woman, and uh, going out on the street every day and facing harassment on a daily basis, it is something that wears you down. It is something that makes you very angry. And getting these little freedoms matter to people who live in Iran. Your New York Times colleague, uh, Thomas Erdbrink, had a wonderful uh, piece yesterday, I think it was, mm -hmm. in which he described the same um, kind of simple uh, facts of social life uh, in, in today's Iran that Nazila was talking about, that um, wearing the veil is, is something you do if, if somebody's watching, but otherwise, who cares? Um, there are buskers, musicians in the streets that um, uh, life is lived on the same template, it sounds like, that, that, that it's lived in Europe or, or the US. And so I want to ask you just, um, is, it, is it possible that uh, the, the, the counter-revolution that we all keep waiting for, in fact, has already happened? That, you know, it's uh, one of my favorite uh, truths about life is that things that really matter aren't the ones that sneak up on you. They're the ones that you s stare in the face, but you just don't recognize them. Is it, is it possible that we're already in this place that we talk about trying to get to? You know, I think uh, Iran has evolved, and so have Iranian leaders. Uh, the changes that we see in Iran wouldn't have been possible without people like Rouhani, without people like Musavi, who is under house arrest now, uh, without people like Rafsanjani and his children. So, uh, you know, I don't think it's just the Iranian people have brought the changes. It's a result of how Iranian leadership has also evolved. And you know, just seeing how things are moving uh, in Iran, I am absolutely sure that the next big transition is gonna come with the next supreme leader, which I'm sure you're gonna raise it again. But I think that's gonna be uh, the next stage when we will see Iran moving uh, towards the next, uh, the Islamic revolution transitioning into its uh, next uh, phase of life, which might be adulthood. Uh, <laughs> yes, or, or there's something that comes after adulthood. Um, so uh, <laughs> let me just ask uh, John and Mohsen if, there, if you have any uh, comments you'd like to make on this question of 
Iranian culture and the cultural change before we move on to policy questions? Yes. Well, well, very, very, very briefly, um, what you saw, I mean, it was part of the, the events that I got caught up in per personally with the occupation of the embassy and then the Iran-Iraq war, uh, both of which were prolonged far beyond what they, uh, the period they needed to be, uh, they needed to be as mobilizing events in order to impose um, a very rigid view of society. I call it um, intrusive compulsive behavior. <laughs> because in fact, um, you people were told what, how to dress, how to walk, how to, inter how to interact, how to touch or not touch each other, what kind of music to listen to, what kind of games they could play or not play. Um, and I think Khomeini himself, in one of his speeches, he understood what was going on and he understood his own people because he said, we, people said, well, people asked him, why are you being so hard on your own people? And he says, because I know them. Give them the chance, they will do everything. They will drink, they will dance, uh, and they will indulge in all kinds of forbidden pleasures. Because they have been doing this for centuries. Read the literature, read the, po read, read the poetry. It's an ongoing struggle uh, between the impulse to, the, the hum a human impulse to enjoy yourself and uh, a vision of imposing a much more rigid view of society. I would say, just to end, just, just to end this, um, this lesson came home to me very vividly, again from the Naval Academy, from when I was teaching up in, up in Annapolis, and I showed them, I had the students, we showed them the students, uh, the film Persepolis, uh, Marjan Satrapi's wonderful film, where she, she shows these young people enjoying themselves, you know, have, or, or at least attempting to enjoy themselves, despite all of the restrictions. And one of my students, after that, I said, what did you think? She, he said, you know, he said, it reminds me of the Naval Academy. <laughs> Very strict rules and hum meet human nature. And in this case, a, a, a very specific kind of human nature with a very specific uh, history behind it. Mohsen, any yeah. uh, comments on the, these questions of the texture of Iranian uh, life really in, in these last 10 years since the Green Revolution? Yeah. Um, Last week, I uh, received an email from a uh, uh, editor of a major magazine in Iran. Uh, they wanted me to recommend a book uh, for, I, for uh, Mr. Rouhani to read. It is a collection of articles they're collecting for Nowruz, the Persian New Year. And they wanted me to recommend the book that uh, Rouhani has to read. So I started thinking about what kind of book can I recommend uh, for him to read? So I finally decided that I'm going to, if I decide to write it, uh, is I'm going to ask him to read Edmund Burke's book on reflections on the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. Because what Burke does in that book tells the French revolutionaries that uh, you're too radical. And your mistake is that uh, you're confusing change of uh, the state with societal change. One is easy. Societal change is extremely difficult. Don't push it. Because when you push people to do certain things, they react against you, especially uh, Iranians. They have a tendency to go against what the government does. So during the Shah's days, they were against the US. And now the government is against the US. And there are a lot of people in favor of the US. And if the U.S. goes back to Iran again, they're going to be against the U.S. <laughs> um, but going back to the excellent question you asked, and uh, both of you said the same thing, and I agree, there is another book that is absolutely essential for anybody who wants to understand what has happened in Iran in the past uh, 40 years. And that's the book by uh, an American 
uh, theorist of revolution, Crane Brenton, the, anat the anatomy of revolution. And he says that revolution is like having high fever. When you have a revolution, you have high fever, you hallucinate. You talk nonsense. You do stupid things. And then uh, it starts with the rule of the moderates, Bazargan and others. Then the radicals take over. And then there is something he calls Thermidorian reaction. I believe since 2009, Iran is going through a slow motion Thermidorian reaction. And the Islamic Republic has concluded, I believe, that there is nothing they can do to stop that. And therefore, they have decided to manage this Thermidorian reaction. That is why you, when you go to Iran, you see the change. They occasionally intervene. They occasionally arrest women. But this is occasional, only to send the message who is in charge in Iran. But the change is uh, undeniable. It's going to come. And nobody is going to be able to stop it. And the best thing the US can do is to understand this change. That's why in my opening remark, I kept talking about, let's get out of this state-centric things. Look at what is happening in Iranian society. John, did you want to jump in? Very, very quickly, I, I, I agree very much with, with most. And the problem in Iran is that people have been waiting for the Thermidor for a very long time. Uh, and uh, I, I still recall, he was the late, the late Barry Rubin, uh, who, who referred to an analyst who talked about the Thermidor coming. He said he, he, said he should eat a large helping of crow Thermidor. <laughs> um, thinking about uh, Crane uh, Brinton's uh, book, uh, An Enemy of, of Revolution, um, I, I've written uh, myself that revolutions are like children. They are lovable when they're, l they're little. <laughs> That's a good they're, point. <laughs> you know, it's hard not to like a young revolution. But as they age, they, they go into their uh, difficult teenage years and become a lot less lovable. And then, let's be honest, they go into a more sclerotic uh, older age when they get brittle, and I think that's probably uh, what, we're, what we're seeing now. I'm going to turn now to some policy questions, and I'm going to ask each of you to respond to a series of them, um, starting with you, Nazila. I want to begin by what uh, I think most uh, uh, American policy leaders, certainly, and may maybe most people in the world would think of as the face of the Iranian revolution that's 40 years old today, and that's the, the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard, the, the armed militant symbol of uh, this clerical regime. The IRGC, uh, it's not simply a statement of U.S. Uh, uh, policy. The IRGC meddles in countries in its neighborhood aggressively uh, from, from Lebanon to Syria to uh, Iraq to, uh, to, to Yemen. And I want to ask, ask each of you to, to talk a little bit about that militant armed face of the revolution and whether you see any signs of it weakening, or maybe to put it a different way, how might it be weakened? Nazila, why don't you start that off? Well, you know, I think, unfortunately, uh, that force that um, the Revolutionary Guards have become stronger and stronger over the past four decades. Uh, and as Barbara mentioned, I mean, they, they have expanded their influence to at least four countries in the region. Um, and the, this is not something that anyone saw coming, neither Iranian people inside the country nor other countries that imposed all those isolationist policies on Iran to contain this particular force. But I think after four decades, we see that uh, this force does thrive in isolation. It invites those kinds of policies. Uh, it invites sanctions. It empowers it. Uh, and this has been perhaps a reactive policy to Iran and its revolution. This, this has been the uh, the policy of the 20th century, 
uh, we are now in the 21st century. The dynamics of the region have changed. Uh, the dynamics inside Iran have changed. Uh, there are many rational forces inside the country that can be engaged uh, in a dialogue. I mean, the nuclear uh, deal was a very good example of that. Uh, and you know, whoever is calling for a more proactive foreign policy toward Iran is being accused of being a sympathizer of the Islamic Republic. Uh, I mean, without paying any attention that the past policies have helped this very uh, radical, dangerous force to become more and more powerful. Uh, but if uh, not just the United States, but Europe, I think Europe is moving more toward that policy of engaging the more uh, reasonable forces in Iranian uh, leadership, like uh, Hassan Rouhani, his foreign ministry, these people are the only ones who have the ability to, to contain uh, radical forces well, in Iran. But, but do they? I mean, to, put, to push the question, if, if Mike Pompeo or Brian Hook, who works for him, were here, they would say that even after the JCPOA, even after this opening to the moderates in Iran, we saw no sign of diminution of the power and regional meddling of the IRGC. It, it just kept on rolling. So, John, what, what would, would, that, would that argument by, uh, by Trump administration officials be right? Um, what's, what's the response to it? Uh, no, it's not. It's not right. I'm, I'm going to take a, a maybe an unpopular view here, but I um, I can remember in 1970 in, in 1979 when I went to Tehran, when I went to Tehran, uh, there was no police force, um, and yet the city was more or less uh, calm. There was very little there was very little crime. People you could come and go. Uh, you could come and go. Uh, it was it was safe. Uh, I make the contrast to Baghdad in 2003, which was which was genuine anarchy and very scary and, and and very scary. And much of that was because of, or at least the the, the forerunners of the revolution of the Revolutionary Guard who were keeping or, who were keeping order, a kind of rough order, but they kept it. Um, I also remember in September or October of '79 attending when I was still an on the street diplomat. Um, I went to a session of the so-called Majlis e the uh, assembly that was writing the new constitution for Iran. And there was an, a debate about this institution of the Revolutionary Guard, which was, in, which was put into the fundamental law, which was put into the fundamental law. And one of the delegates there argued against it. And he said, you are creating, you're creating a monster. We risk creating a Praetorian Guard, which will overpower the other institutions of the state. Now he turned out to be right, but who list? No one, uh, no one listened. Uh, I am, in general, I'm very wary of the the kind of uh, broad brush de uh, demonizing that you see from this administra administration. Uh, that this this go government is completely bad. The Revolutionary Guards are, are this or that. Remember one thing: when you condemn the Revolutionary Guards, you are also condemning the people who fought the hardest against the Iraqi invaders. Mm -hmm. You're also condemning people um, people's relatives who died in that fight. Uh, to defend their uh, to defend their country, so before you go out and make blanket denunciations, which we seem to be very good at these days, uh, you 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 should think harder. Try. To, I know it's difficult. The word nuance isn't very popular these days in this town, but select your words carefully. Um, if the you know if the, there are there are a lot of negatives. Involved. Now, Zila has mentioned them also, in, also domestic, do, domestically, and that's the thing you go after. But denouncing an, insti denouncing an institution this way, effectively, you have alienated a lot of ordinary people um, whose relatives, sons, brothers, fathers, husbands, whatever, uh, went out and sacrificed themselves for their country. 
So, Mohsen, what would be your judgment about wise policy to bend the arc of the IRGC, this, this symbol, threatening symbol of the revolution? Um, if you go back to uh, 2003 to 2006, when the U.S. Uh, invaded Iraq, uh, I think one of the greatest uh, mistakes the U.S. made inside Iraq was to demolish uh, the Iraqi armed forces. Mm. Well, Ayatollah Khomeini uh, was much smarter. In 1979, when he took over, uh, he knew that the Iranian army, 500,000 strong, was essentially American trained, uh, with a lot of uh, people uh, supportive of the US. He got rid of the top echelon, but at the same time, he created a brand new force called the Revolutionary Guards, whose member mostly came from the lower classes, or what I call the forgotten classes in Iran. His goal was twofold, to prevent a coup against the Islamic Republic, and secondly, to create a force that is protective, not of the government, but of the Nizam Jumhuri Islami, which is much bigger than the government. It includes the Velayat e So in Iran, what you have is Velayat e one side of the coin, and then you have the revolutionary guard, the other side. If you look at the history of modern Iran, we seldom have had military government, like the one we have in Egypt or in Pakistan. We've had monarchy and we've had Islamic Republic. Now, the Revolutionary Guards play a very important role in Iran today, but this role was gradual. They came of age during the Iran-Iraq War. As, as John correctly says, had it not been for them, part of Iran would have been part of Iraq today. That's the reality people don't want to admit. And gradually, they started play, playing a much bigger role in the economic system as well as in the political system. And today, they do decide Iranian foreign policy in the region. But what is important to know about the Revolutionary Guard is that although the name suggests in the title of the Revolutionary Guard, the word Iran is not mentioned. And there is a reason for it. They want to protect Islam as a religion. But I don't get fooled by names. I look at actually what they do. And if you pay attention to what they have been doing recently, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards are relying more and more in a subtle way on Iranian nationalism. Mm. They're using Iranian nationalism uh, to justify Iranian uh, expansion of power in the Middle East. And it is very subtle, but it's a very powerful way. The most important thing to remember about the Revolutionary Guards, not only they are powerful economic force, they are one of the few entities in Iran whose budget has not been cut this year. There is a massive cut in a lot of areas, but not for the Revolutionary Guards, not for the besieges. There is a cut for uh, Iranian defense uh, and also when Ayatollah Khomeini was selected as the supreme leader, uh, the Revolutionary Guards played a minor role. It was Ayatollah Hashemi Rafsanjani who played a decisive role in pushing for Ayatollah Khomeini. Well, David, when they have to choose the next supreme leader, the Revolutionary Guards are going to play the key role. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to uh, close with two. Um, quick questions about what's ahead, and then we're going to turn to, to the audience um, uh, for a good half hour of your uh, questions, so please be, be thinking uh, about what you'd like to, to ask this panel. I want to uh, begin um, by um, talking about uh, U.S. policy under, under Donald Trump and the uh, sanctions that this administration is imposing, and, and imposing not simply on Iran, but on European and other countries that trade with Iran. And I want to ask you to, to think about where that's heading. And let's, let's just posit 
that these sanctions are going to be as effective as they seem likely to be. That is to say, um, they will make it harder for Iran to export oil. They will make it harder, not impossible, for Iran to import things it needs. They'll just they'll squeeze that economy, already fragile. The administration seems t- to think that as it basically undermines the coherence of the Iranian economy, that good things will happen that all the ferment that was evident in the demonstrations that began 18 months ago in Mashhad and swept to every little city will surface again and that you'll have a process that will lead to something positive. My own sense, but this is what I want to ask each of you, is that the more likely outcome of shattering the Iranian economy is that we'll have another failed state in the Middle East. But let me ask each of you to to say, starting with Nazila, what you think is ahead, assuming that these US sanctions work. So I think, you know, first of all, the sanctions are putting pressure on Iranian people, not on the regime or the Revolutionary Guards. Uh, Secondly, the regime is expert at cracking down protests even if there are protests that are similar to the ones that occurred a year ago, the regime will crack them down. It has no difficulty in putting an end to them. So this is not going to lead to an implosion from within. Um, But if these sanctions were to work, I think Iranian leadership is going to pick up the chalice of poison once again and come to the negotiation mm-hmm. table. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but there's not going to be much change. I mean, what we have learned from the past behaviors of the Islamic Republic is that Iranian leaders uh, have no fear to change, uh, just to survive, uh, just to stay in power. Uh, I mean, I remember I was 17, um, and the slogans of, uh, we will go as far as Karbala, were still on the walls in the capital city of Tehran when Khomeini announced the end of the war. And you know he said he was drinking the chalice of poison. Uh, and it took a long, long time to get, up, get rid of those uh, slogans. I mean, we thought, I thought the war would go on forever. I mean, as long as they could have volunteers to fight for them, it would go on. But when pressure came uh, uh, to that point that they didn't have anyone to fight, I mean, he ended it mm-hmm. and as if like, as if he had never said that he would not end the war. So, you know, and you know what Khamenei said last week was interesting, uh, which again brings me back to uh, to the fact that you know change has come to Iran, but it has come very slowly. And you know, good change, permanent change does come slowly. I remember I met uh, Barbara for the first time 20 years ago on this day uh, in Azadi Square. Uh, it was the 20th anniversary of, of the revolution, and Khatami was president, and he was speaking. And some of the marchers began chanting, death to America. And he asked them not to. Mm. He said that it was an insult to American people, and the slogan was not meant for the American people. It took 20 years for Khamenei to say the same thing. I see. John, what, what's your thought about where maximum US pressure leads? Who was the, maybe one of the colleagues here knows where this comes from, but who, I think it was an Iranian political scientist who once said, he said, we, we never give in to pressure. We only give in to a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> the, the question in my mind, and this goes back to my time with the Obama administration is, what do we mean when we say the sanctions worked? Uh, Because if something works, it means that you have achieved a goal. And to achieve a goal, you have to have a goal. (laughs) And I'm not sure what the goal is of the sanctions. Is it that, the, the whole Islamic Republic collapses, and you have the failed state that, uh, 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 that David mentioned, uh, or is it that 
um, Iran, the, the Islamic Republic sees the light and says, well, now, uh, now, we'll, now we're ready to give you what you want, uh, um, give you what you want, or is it something else, uh, um, or is it something else? I'm not, I'm not sure. It's that wonderful phrase from, from Alice in Wonderland, I think, where it says, uh, I think it was the Cheshire Cat says, well, if, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. <laughs> so you can you can pick the sang I mean you 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 can pick the sanctions. Um, I'm not um, um, I'm not sure what they mean, but I will second what uh, what uh, Nazila what uh, Nazila said uh, that it's very it's it's very clear. I mean this this um, the government the Islamic Republic has survived forty years, which is far beyond what most people predicted. Uh, I mean, at the beginning of the remember at the beginning of the revolution, people went around saying, "When are they leaving?" Like tomorrow. Uh, that was the thought. That, the, uh, that was the thought, and it has survived because that it is that has become its priority, and it will do what it has to do in order to survive. And if it means being ex being uh, uh, being brutal in the extreme. Uh, murdering political pri murdering political prisoners, for example, jailing dissidents, whatever, whatever that it will do. But if it also means what was what was uh, Khamenei's phrase, heroic flexibility, if if that's what it means, that it also will do. If it means drinking the cup of poison, it will do that. Uh, um, it will do that. And at some point, if it comes to the, if it comes to the point and said, oh, okay, in order to Survive in order to stay in to stay in power, which we really want to do. Which we really want to do, we're going to need to go back and negotiate. The question is, if they do that, once that happens, then what does you know? The United States becomes a little bit like the dog that chased the bus. Now you've caught the bus. What do you do with it? Uh, because I think, my, looking at this, looking at this administration, I don't see a coherent vision for what we do want. I mean, some people, um, um, some people maybe want uh, uh, one of the diaspora groups or the exile groups to take over. Some some people, um, some people simply want to uh, uh, trash the previous president uh, by any means possible. Uh, but there really isn't. There, there really isn't clarity that I see as a goal. So going back to the question, um, do, will the sanctions work? Uh, I'm not sure we have an idea of what it means, uh, what it means to work. Of course, the danger is that uh, they may work too. They may, they may be they may work too well, and you get a whole system uh, uh, system collapse, and you get a country that is. Uh, that, for example, as partition begins to fall apart on ethnic, religious uh, religious lines or something else, which anyone who, if you've studied the history, is really the country's worst nightmare, mm. the breakdown of security. Uh, Mosen, how would you how would you answer this uh, this this question of of what maximum pressure will do, uh, what the outcome of this policy will be? I. Uh, uh, like John, I really do not know uh, what is the strategy behind the sanctions. I think, and I want to underline, I think uh, the logic behind it is that if we put sufficient uh, economic and political and psychological, and the last part I think is as important as the first one, psychological pressure uh, on, on Iran, then there is a pretty good chance of uh, massive uprisings in Iran. And with the help of uh, an opposition that we're going to establish outside of Iran, uh, who knows, we might either push Iran uh, on the abyss of collapse, or we could uh, have regime change, or uh, they could come to the negotiating table. Now, that is a little bit hodgepodge of what you want. That's not a strategy. This is uh, uh, delusion. Because if you're looking for a regime change, there are certain things you need to do now. If you're looking for uh, 
pressuring Iran to come to the negotiating table. You cannot burn all your bridges and say 40 years of revolution has been a total failure. How dare you, are you going to go back to the negotiating table with a team that has brought 40 years of failure? So I cannot understand what is behind the strategy. Maybe it's going to change. What I do know, and here I have to take a different road, I am not as pessimistic as a lot of people are. Iran is going to face a lot of problems, no doubt about it. But if there is one thing Iran, the Islamic Republic, has proven to do, is that they perform more efficiently when they're under a lot of pressure. If there is one thing we know about this regime, and John is absolutely right, a lot of pressure might bring them to the negotiating table, but they're going to wait until the last moment. Look at what they did with the Iran-Iraq war. They could have finished the war in 1982. They didn't. Uh, look at what they did with the hostage crisis for the release of John and many other innocent Americans. They waited, they waited, they waited, and it was not, uh, it, they really didn't get a lot of benefit from it. So the calculation in Tehran, in my judgment, is that we have two more years of tough time. We're going to wait and see who's going to win the American presidential elections. If somebody other than uh, Donald Trump wins, then they think that we have a pretty good chance of negotiating. If Donald Trump is there, we might be able to negotiate with them. Hassan Rouhani said something very important a couple of days ago. He said, if America repent, we are willing to negotiate with wow. them. Now, let me translate that for you in the Iranian context. Forget about if part of it, if America repents. That's for, that's for the masses. It's the second part. He is beginning to prepare the stage for possible negotiations. But I don't think they're going to do it uh, until 2020. But let me tell you my own position. I believe as soon as uh, Trump withdrew from the nuclear deal, I wrote about it, I tweeted about it, I said it's time for Iran to start negotiating with the US. And I think if there is one thing we have learned from North Korea is that unlike some people around the president, he really wants to. I think ultimately he doesn't want a war and he wants to negotiate. So um, I'm going to uh, end our conversation and, and open the conversation to you with just one. Uh, I'm going to answer my own question. Um, if you look at Trump's behavior, it's pretty obvious where he's going. You know, his style is to rant and rave and put on sanctions and maximum pressure and scare the heck out of everybody. And um, then, uh, you know, he'll see the opportunity to sit down and do the undoable, the deal that's never been done. Uh, he did this with Kim Jong-un, most obviously. He did it uh, with Mexico and Canada. You know, completely new NAFTA. Well, we all know it's not really very different. Um, and he's getting ready to do it, I think, in the next few weeks with China and de declaring victory there. Uh, I <laughs> quoted in a column uh, Trump saying to Emmanuel Macron, who was at the UN uh, General Assembly uh, this year, and said, uh, Mr. President, I have to go see uh, uh, President Rouhani tomorrow. W what should I tell him? And Trump is supposed to have said, um, I want to sit down with him but not yet. <laughs> he, he needs to feel a little more pain. So I would be, uh, let, me, let me turn to, to the audience. Uh, yes, sir, you right there, and then the gentleman here, and then you. Wait for the microphone. Please introduce yourself. Please keep the questions short. I'm so a we can Peter get Humphrey, an intel analyst and a former diplomat. I wanted to ask a little bit about uh, track two diplomacy. Um, Iranians are not particularly well known for their ping pong skills, but their science is pretty awesome. Uh, uh, biology, uh, medicine, uh, seismology, geology, oceanography is pretty good. Um, what would we have to lose by a completely apolitical, off to the side, 
uh, binational uh, scientific cooperation initiative. Um, is, th is there not some wisdom in playing good cop, bad cop at the same time? Do you want to, John, you want to answer that? Very, br very briefly, we've been doing it. Um, and, um, you know, we've been exchanging athletes, filmmakers, artists, environmentalists. We have an uh, expert, here, expert here in the audience, David Leyland, on, that sub on, on the subject of environmentalists and wildlife. Um, we've been doing it. Um, it has, unfortunately, at least on the political level, hasn't changed much. In fact, some of the people involved uh, a few years ago, these were uh, uh, HIV AIDS people uh, and then recently environmentalists, uh, have gotten themselves thrown in jail for, this, for their trouble. Uh, not that it's a bad thing. I mean, does anyone know that there's a statue of Olam Reza Tahti, the famous wrestler, um, in Alabama? <laughs> of all places, um, in, at Alabama? The, in Alabama, in the, at the World Museum of Wrestling. Oh, I see. I uh, was a gold medal. I believe he was a gold medalist. Yes, he was. Uh, uh, back in the fifties, in, uh, um, in the in the fifties. I mean, this this is great stuff. So, you know, filmmakers. Obviously, look at the Iranian film. Mm. Look at the Iranian film uh, uh, film industry, for example, and those are the success that it's had. Uh, yeah, this is you know this is good, and it carries on. It can. Believe it or not, even today, it continues um, under the radar um, in, a lot of, in a lot of cases. Um, the problem is, as, as I said, as far as I could tell, we've been doing this, well, it really started, I th a lot of this started uh, in Khat when, when Khatami became president back in 97, yeah. so we've been doing it for over 20 years. Uh, but it hasn't had the political effect that we would have liked. I mean, the ping pong, you use the ping pong diplomacy. Uh, that, cha that changed things very fast. That changed things very, fa very fast. In the Iranian case, for some, for some reasons, uh, it has not. So let me turn to the gentleman here sitting on the, uh, the end of that row, and then we may begin collecting a few questions after that so as to get more in. Salam alaikum. What's that? Oh, okay. <laughs> Salam alaikum. My name is Hassan. I was born in Tehran. I so happened to be in Tehran when the revolution was coined. Now it's been 40 years. I hear that you say uh, the revolution has survived. That's a use of word. I say the revolution has advanced. This country is not the same country that was 40 years ago. And things that are happening there, the main uh, force behind the revolution is not a person, is not that idea or verses of Quran. If people here are Muslims, they can go there and read the revolution, uh, the uh, uh, verses of Quran that was revealed at the last part of the Quran when it says that today we complete your book, we give you all of the bounties, and in our uh, opinion, Islam is the way, and then that is the, be uh, the force behind the revolution. Now, my question is this, America is, uh, you know, you hear the chant that say, Mark Bar Amrika all the time. The Amrika that they're saying is not you, is not you, is not the people who are sitting here. Is the system that is acting in uh, against the wills of the people who live in a certain part. And as they said that the Ayatollah Khamenei also said, don't say it anymore. I just want to make a little joke because America is not in very good shape right now. So they stop saying that now. Well, I know, you know, well, that's right. So we have certain uh, uh, proverbs in our you know, language. We say, Bozak namir bahar miyad, kompozo khiyar miyad. Means that America is giving false hope to Americans. Let's wait these people out. They're going to die out. They're going to, Khamenei is going to die out. Right. The question is, So uh, when is America going to get it? And, I, and if the, the it that I, if I'm understanding you, is the, the intense 
religious core of, of the revolution. Right, Let it. me ask Mohsen if he would respond uh, to that. Yes, uh, one thing, if I may, go back to the question the gentleman asked about uh, track two and other things. Uh, four years ago, I went to Los Angeles for uh, World Wrestling Championship or something. Uh, and uh, as you know, wrestling is, uh, is uh, really loved by a lot of Iranians, and uh, John was mentioning Quran Reza Tahti. And I was surprised, I really was surprised, because when the American team was fighting against another team, that entire stadium, 90% were Iranians. USA, USA, <laughs> and I'm sitting and so what the hell is wrong with these guys? They came here for Iran and for the US. I think uh, sports diplomacy is the key to push uh, for that. But going back to what the gentleman said, um, yes, uh, I think there is uh, uh, support for the uh, revolution in Iran still, although that support has diminished significantly. Having said that, though, there is absolutely no justification for death to America. This is the single greatest nonsense that we have followed in the past 40 years in Iran. It has damaged the Islamic Republic. It has damaged the image of Iran as a country. It is counterproductive, and it is beneath the dignity of an old civilization. It doesn't matter what Ayatollah Khomeini says. What matters is that the perception people get in this country, there is no reason why Iran should say death to America. Even if they mean it is the government, then what are they doing? They're calling for regime change. That's none of their business. So I hope they stop chanting this nonsense. If, if, I, may, if I may just in, add a thing. You know, when you, when, you start have to, when you start have to put footnotes on your slogans, <laughs> <laughs> you know, then you're in serious trouble, I think. <laughs> so um, no footnotes here. So I, I saw Marina Ottaway's hand up. I'm going to call on Marina, and then we're going to collect four questions here. Marina, and then the gentleman here in the second row, and then you, sir, uh, and then madam. So those four questions, and then we'll come back to the panel. Marina. Thank you. Marina Ottaway with Woodson Center. Hi, Moxen. Uh, I'd like to go back to the issue of social change you have been talking about. And what is the political significance you attach to it? Because we are seeing right now in Saudi Arabia a deliberate promotion of social change in that sense, of opening up the society, allowing entertainment and so on, which is directly aimed at depoliticizing the society. So I'm not sure that this kind of social opening is necessarily a good thing in terms of the politics of the country. Uh, gentleman in the second row, please. And hold on, we have a microphone that will be to you momentarily. Do we have a, do we, can we give this gentleman a microphone, please? David Leyland, for my sins and old time Iran Han. Um, comment. This gentleman, I was last in Iran a year and a half ago, the only American at something called SDS, Sand and Dust Storm Conference. And my uh, <clears throat> talk was uh, after being briefed by Glenn Schweitzer, who was the real hero of Track 2 Diplomacy and Scientific Exchange Programs from the National Academy of Sciences. My comment was that American scientists really want to continue their uh, relationships with the Iranians. Well, afterwards, I had three deputy ministers come up and, and thank me. My point being that there's a tremendous desire, both in Iran and the United States, to maintain these. However, as my friends that are in jail right now have experienced, the regime does not want to have Western uh, relationships, especially the United States. My question, sir, to the extent that Israel do, is determinant in American policy, what is I Israel's hope with respect to Iran? Uh, the gentleman just behind you, if you could hand the, the microphone back uh, one row. Yes. Um, Honar Issa from the American University of Kurdistan, I'm a member of the governing board. And my question actually is, um, I, I very often um, you know, hear from officials from the State Department and you know, other people from the U.S. government that 
the goal for the sanction is to stop uh, Iran from expanding its power to the region and you know control their influence. To what extent uh, the sanction would help and would support that agenda that they have? I mean, a lot of uh, people just complain there. Thank you. And the, the just we have the yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you. This is Faye Mokhtar. I'm a member of Atlantic Council. Fantastic panel, Dr. Milani. Thank you so much for your articulate discussion of uh, Iran's uh, and David and Nazila. My question to you is, Dr. Milani, do you really think the Iranians will actually come to the table to renegotiate a deal that took years of a um, great deal of efforts? You had the best team possible, all Western graduates. Uh, and uh, do you think that they would come to the table to renegotiate uh, a better deal. Thank you. So we have four questions. We'll come back to the panel. The first uh, was um, are these social changes um, depoliticizing the situation? Maybe Nazila, you could take that. Um, second question, in part, um, what does Israel uh, uh, want in terms of the uh, process of, of Evolution in Iran. And John will take that. John can, oh, John can take that. Thank you, Moshe. What a, what a friend you are. And uh, <laughs> sanctions. Um, uh, will sanctions stop Iranian regional behavior? Most of you can uh, take that. And also, for you, the specific question um, about um, will I Iran actually renegotiate? these agreements. Nazila, start us off. So I totally agree that, you know, giving more cultural and social freedom to people does depoliticize people. But, you know, we can say that sitting here in the United States, enjoying all the freedoms that we have. Uh, there are 80 million people living in Iran. They are the ones who are dealing with the daily harassment, daily intimidation. And, you know, I mean, look at it. I mean, none of it has been really suppressed. I mean, the best music is coming out of Iran. The best, best movies are coming from inside Iran. Uh, the Iranian community in LA is not producing anything culturally as significant as what we are getting from Iran. So no, this community does need space to grow, to develop, and I, I don't think anyone looks at it that way inside Iran. John. Uh, you've given me the easy question. You, uh, you've given me the easy question again. David did. I, I no, it's a good that. one. Uh, no, no it's, a, it's a good one. And it, it, it's also, it's one of the reasons, I think, one of the reasons it took, in, in the Obama administration, it, took, it sort of took four years for the original ideas to, 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 uh, to produce effects, to start the process that led to the nuclear agreement, the, um, led to the nuclear agreement, along which were a whole series of, change, of, of changes that were moving in a positive, direc uh, positive direction. Uh, and one, one, of the problems, uh, one of the problems was, again, the Islamic Republic's rhetoric, go back to death to America. What about death to Israel? What about phrases like, you know, we will erase it from the pages of time or how, whatever language was used. Again, uh, I've heard people try to, uh, how do you say, deconstruct these slogans, uh, but they don't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work. Um, and, you know, you, what you have, and the problem, the other problem here in this country uh, is that the voice, the voices that we hear are, I think, come from one segment of uh, the Israeli body politic, which is pretty far on the right, which is, is, is pretty far on the right. Uh, when I talk to Israeli friends, they tell me there's actually a very vigorous debate uh, within, is within Israel. I mean, there are vigorous debates in within Israel over everything, but on the case of Iran policy, there is also a vigorous, de uh, vigorous debate. Uh, but, what, but it's very sad because one of the reasons that we, one of the reasons that the U.S. could not go farther than it did in during the first term of the Obama administration was because, frankly, it was, the, it was the existence of President Ahmadinejad and his association with Holocaust denial, his association with some of the more extreme statements uh, uh, that he had made. Uh, and so he had become, because of that, um, he had become, in this town, he had become, to, to coin a phrase, radioactive or toxic. Um, and anything he said or did uh, whether it was reasonable or unreasonable, no one would listen to. 
And it wasn't until 2013 when he was gone. And the saying, the saying goes that when, when, he, was, when, he, le when he left office, uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu went into mourning. <laughs> because he lost the best vote getter that he had, the, uh, uh, the best boogeyman or vote getter that he, ha the, uh, uh, that he had. But once he had, le once he had left office, then you saw things beginning to change and change fast. I mean, you saw in, in September 2013, you saw Kerry and uh, Secretary Kerry and Foreign Minister Zarif sitting down together in New York as two, as, as the two foreign ministers had not done since October of 1979, when uh, Foreign Minister uh, Yazdi and Secretary Vance met at a meeting, by the way, which if you read the accounts, was a disaster. Um, now you have a, a meeting that is positive, uh, positive and productive. Think about it. When was the last time those two adjectives were used? <laughs> in anything involving the United States and, uh, uh, and Iran. But clearly, the rhetoric against Israel, the views, of, the views of Israel played a big role in that paralysis and made it, and one of the reasons it became, it was so difficult, despite, you know, despite a lot of goodwill on both sides, it was so difficult to make that change. have to ask the Israelis. I would never, you know, I, uh, I, if I've learned, if I learned anything from being in the Foreign Service, David, you never speak for another country. <laughs> Wilson. Um, first question about uh, the gentleman from uh, uh, Kurdistan. Uh, if you uh, look at the uh, first page of the uh, nuclear deal between Iran and six global powers, uh, you'll see that it says, we hope, we hope this nuclear deal is going to lead to uh, incorporation of Iran into the world economic system. But then it talks about obligations. Unfortunately, in Washington for the past two years, some people have confused hope with obligation. Iran has uh, implemented its obligations. The hope was that Iran would become a normal state. Well, we didn't give it enough time. A year and a half after this nuclear deal, when not all the sanctions were lifted, we came out of the negotiation deal. So now they talk about putting pressure on Iran to change its policies. It's not gonna happen. The reason why it's not gonna happen is that the foundation of Iranian regional policy is based on threat perception. It is based on uh, forward defense. Their thinking is that if we expand the Iranian power to Afghanistan, to Lebanon, to Syria, to Yemen, uh, to Lebanon, in case we are attacked, we have somebody outside of our borders can take revenge. Now, whether it's right or wrong, I'm not arguing about this. What I'm arguing is that as long as there is that perception of threat, Iran might retreat here and there, but there is not going to be a fundamental change in Iranian regional policy. I do believe that if this country would have continued with the nuclear deal, they could have negotiated to make some radical changes in Iranian policy, because ultimately, Iran has already become overstretched, overcommitted, and Iranian gains cannot be sustained in the long term, or the Iranian economy and the Iranian people will suffer considerably. Now, this, the question about will Iran come to the negotiating table, um, they have no choice eventually. They must. Uh, but uh, they're going to have some demands. And I think one of the key demands is that if we have to come and negotiate about the nuclear deal, the fundamentals of that nuclear deal has to be protected. Then maybe we can add a few things. Diplomacy is the art of making things that don't look possible possible. It's an art. And I think if there is one thing uh, Iranians should be proud of is that for 2,500 years, 
they have learned the art of diplomacy and negotiations. They can do it. The problem is, will Iran have the political will? And will Washington send sufficient signals to Iran that they're not going to do what they have already done? The greatest damage this administration has done is to diminish the confidence a lot of people, a lot of moderates in Iran had about the US. Because only two years after signing a nuclear deal, we came out of it. Uh, and it doesn't look good if you are an Iranian inside Iran and have been pushing for good relations with the US. And I guarantee you, every American ally in the Middle East is watching this. And every American ally, every single one of them, if they can think straight, are beginning to doubt about the reliability of this country as an ally. They might not say it to you because they have no choice. But deep down, they think about it. And the sooner we try to correct this mistake, uh, the better it is. Because ultimately, I believe, I strongly believe, that it is in the national interest of Iran, is in the national interest of the US to become good friends again. And I hope, and I'm doing everything I can as a university professor to push the two countries toward reconciliation. This is why I have the greatest respect for this man who has put aside his anger about Iran and is looking at what is good for Iran and what is good for the US. Now, would you say, Mohsen, yet that the Iranian policy today is regime change in Washington? That's, eg <laughs> uh, that's exactly what death to America means. <laughs> So I think with that- They uh, have as much chance of succeeding as Washington has in changing right. regime change in Iran. <laughs> with those uh, comments from our co-host, um, Professor Milani, I think that's a, a good time to end this uh, session. I hope that we've given you a good start to an extraordinary day of thinking about one of the most important issues in the world. And please uh, join me in thanking our panel for speaking so clearly.